Well, this morning's discussion will revolve around the um, exotic theme of disincarnate uh, intelligences and non-human entities that seem to occupy a kind of undefined ontological limbo in terms of uh, precisely what their status in the world is. Whatever their status in the world is, when you start looking at the question of these disincarnate entities, um, the first thing that strikes you is their persistence in human experience and folklore. This is not something uh, unusual or statistically rare in all times and in all places with the possible exception of Western Europe for the past 200 years a kind of social commerce between human beings and various kinds of disincarnate entities uh, or non-human intelligences was taken for granted and this could be as simple as the Celtic farmer's wife leaving out a pitcher of milk for the fey folk, or it could take more uh, elaborate forms. Um, because the second aspect of this question that you encounter is the tremendous variety of these entities that we're apparently talking about a kind of parallel taxa in another continuum because we have jinns, afrites, uh, water nixies, uh, boulder grinders, uh, gnomes. The list is endless, and that's only the uh, list within the context of the European imagination. Once you add in all the... Uh, various ethnic takes on the potential for non-human intelligent life forms, you have a truly vast uh, array of peculiar uh, creatures, all expressive of a very fundamental belief system that seems to be inimical to the human condition. Well, before we get into the history of this idea, it might be good to simply review the uh, logical options that are open to us in examining a phenomenon of this sort. And I take the logical options to be basically three, that these entities are in some sense, or that some of these entities are uh, rare but physical and they uh, sort of operate somewhere between the Coleacanth and the Bigfoot. They m it potentially could be imagined moving from the realm of mythology into the realm of established uh, zoological or botanical fact. And this has in fact happened in uh, some fairly unspectacular cases. This is certainly the least interesting. But for example, the Yeti, is a creature which refuses mm. to declare whether it is simply a rare member of the ordinary taxa <laughs> of this planet or something quite different. The second option <laughs> that lies before us when we look at the ontological status of these entities is what I would think of as the Jungian position. And to demonstrate it, I'll simply quote Jung on the subject of uh, sprites and elementals. He calls them uh, autonomous fragments of psychic energy which have temporarily escaped from the controlling power of the ego. In other <laughs> words, this is what I would call the mentalist mentalist reductionist approach mm. to disincarnate entities and intelligences. It's saying they are somehow uh, part and parcel of our own minds and their existence yes. is dependent upon our uh, conceiving them as objects in our imagination, however pathologically expressed. In other words, the humanist position that all God's entities and so on are merely projections, projections. of our own minds. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. The projection, escaped mental... From pro well, escaped from the controlling <laughs> force of the ego. It's a wonderful image. <laughs> and then the third 
and obviously more interesting but fraught with uh, argumentative pitfalls is that these are one non-physical and two autonomous in their existence in some sort in some sense in other words that they actually do carry on an existence independence of their being independent of their being perceived by human beings and then uh, and this is the position, the classical position, of those who have had the largest amount of experience dealing with these entities, which are shamans, ecstatics, and so-called sensitive or edge types in all kinds of social situations. Uh, this position, which is the most, in a sense, uh, elegant and commiserate with the evidence, that they are in fact autonomous and non-physical, nevertheless poses a tremendous barrier for the scientific and Western mind because the eradication of spirit from the visible world has been a project prosecuted with great zeal with, uh, concomitant to the rise of modern science. And the admission that that project overlooked something as fundamental as a communicating intelligent agency uh, co-present with us on this planet would be more than a dangerous admission of, uh, of uh, the failure of an intellectual method. It would pretty much seal the bankruptcy of an intellectual method. <laughs> so science has handled this problem by creating a tiny subset within its vast mansion of concerns called schizophrenia. And schizophrenia has been uh, deemed a concern of psychologists, not the most honored members of the legion of the house of science. <laughs> and they have been told to take care of this problem, please. And this is where we get the Jungian mentalist reductionist model. What's interesting about that model, which is the reigning model of what entities may be, is that its um, appeal is in direct proportion to your lack of direct experience with the phenomenon that it seeks to explain. In other words, everyone who has ever encountered a disincarnate uh, intelligence of this sort knows that this is a pitifully inadequate, a woefully inadequate description of the phenomenon. Uh, before I close, I just want to make one digression uh, to drive home the point that this is not a uh, pursuit of dilettantes or obscurantists, the question of the status of these entities, because if we examine the history of early modern science, we discovered that some of the major movers and shakers in that situation were in fact uh, being guided and directed in the formulation of uh, early science by disincarnate entities. In the case of John Dee, the great flower of Elizabethan science, he actually had commerce with angels uh, and all sorts of entities of this type uh, over decades, no less a founder of modern scientific rationalism than René Descartes actually was set on the path uh, toward the realization of the ideals of modern science by an angel who appeared to him in a dream and told him that the conquest of nature is to be achieved through measure and number. This enunciation, which is really the battle cry of modern science, first passed from the lips of an angel. Mm. So, and then uh, the well-known example of Kekule, the discoverer of the benzene ring, by seeing the Ouroboric symbol, the snake taking its tail in its mouth, the ancient symbol of eternity, and understanding that it was the solution to a molecular structure problem that he had been dealing with. Mm. This aspect of science 
that much of its premises have been transferred to mankind from a hidden realm of higher intelligence is completely suppressed in its own official history, which is that it's the story of rational thought's conquest of the dark world of superstition. So I think uh, uh, as we look at these entities, as we try to place them in context to, to human society, a, a more... Um, a way of internalizing what they can do for us is to look more toward the shamanic model where these spirits were not only identified but the uh, adjective helping was added and what was envisioned was a kind of symbiosis between ourselves and an invisible world of higher intent and this has certainly been lacking in the expression of modern science as a social force and uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea, perhaps, to, in any future model of uh, society, to attempt to inculcate into it uh, whatever wisdom, whatever insight is represented by these uh, forces. Now, I suppose it would be not fair to close without mentioning that the aversion to the irrational is something that science... Uh, inherited from Christianity and that what uh, all of these voices of nature, of the sky, of the earth uh, were suppressed by Christianity in favor of the triune mystery of the Trinity and a rebirth or a rise in the volume of the voices of the elementals which is how I interpret what's going on seems to me part and parcel with the ecological crisis of the planet. I mean, the planet is attempting to speak. Everything which can signify is reaching out toward humanity to try and reclaim us for the family of nature from this rather pathological trip that we've been on for a long time. So the elementals, these voices, the promptings of the disincarnate entities are... Uh, if not to be heeded, certainly to be carefully considered and studied, we are wandering in a wilderness and here is a prompting voice. So then the analysis, without uh, prior commitment to any kind of epistemic conclusion, would seem very useful at this point. Hmm. So that's all I really have to say about it. I'll bet. <laughs> 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 well, I think this is very modest, Terence, that you have given the survey of these different views. Actually, we have our own view as we'll uh, evolve in these next minutes. So I'd like to attempt to give a rocket boost into our own sphere here to get started. And uh, I'll try uh, a model, a sort of a mathematical model, which I think we're all close to, and that is the trinity of uh, early Christianity, which came from uh, directly from the Neoplatonic. This is the one called not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, but the body, the soul, and the spirit. Here, The body is more or less the Gaia of the Orphic Trinity, the material, ordinary reality, the matter, energy, universe, and and soul is the soul we speak about, and the spirit is kind of a medium in between the body and the soul like the Holy Ghost. And <clears throat> I think that entities, um, that there are kind of abstract entities, that the, 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 the Logos contains intelligence, information, evolving stuff. And uh, we could just sort of try um, identifying this with the top layer and the soul, the world soul level. And here are kind of abstract, we don't know how, we don't have a cognitive strategy for dealing directly with entities in the world soul. But the world soul is coupled to this, uh, the Gaia level, where our um, minds are operating closer to the material plane than the soul plane because of the limitations of language. The separation of conscious and unconscious has to do with this triune model. So as 
an abstract entity difficult to cognate because of its complexity in the multidimensional spheres of the world soul, reaches down, propagates through the, the spirit, which is a kind of like electromagnetic field, a, a medium, you see, extending between these parallel planes or concentric spheres of, of, of soul and individual mind, then it comes more and more into cognitive forms which belong to our mind in its evolution in the sense of morphic morphogenetic field. And then it gets into representations which are culturally dependent, such as uh, fairies, dakinis, and elementals, and, and so on. So this is just a background model where I, I think we're closer than, this is closest to three of your list, the non-physical but real. But it also allows for a kind of a spectrum of different forms of what are essentially the same entities and that their representation they might be timeless more or less uh, in the celestial sphere as it were but their cognitive map into our own consciousness dependent on our paradigm our worldview and so on is evolving and for this reason you get in different cultures the, the elves the fairies the pantheon of gods and so on and particularly in the Christian even though this triune model was made illegal, I think it was in 879 in the Council of Byzantium that the spirit was made illegal, and then we went from three to two, so it is only body and soul. For this reason that no one nowadays, this is, I think, the reason why no one knows the difference between spirit and soul and thinks that they're the same. And we talk about spiritual, the inspiration, bringing down the spirit into the world, which we need now because our society has had an expiration over the past 200 years, as you said. In order to have an inspiration, we have to know what is spirit and what is soul, if they're not the same. And we, we need to learn this model or some other model if there is one more appropriate to our time. So I think that this is a, a context in which we could uh, place in parallel and with full validity all of these different representations and in this list in your initial taxonomy I think we should include the saints and saintesses of the Christian and the Catholic religion because in spite of um, the one God the Yahweh theme of the Judeo-Christian tradition there uh, exist always this changing and l local uh, list of deities which actually are the Christian form of these elves and and so on and uh, we have the the idea of the, the 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 timeless forms or even there's an evolution let us say on a slower time scale in the celestial sphere but their representations are multifarious and these representations closer to our own cognition these are evolving very rapidly and we have the different time scales kind of like mathematical physics that uh, we can deal with in discussing this. That makes possible, in other words, to make identifications between an earth spirit of this culture and an earth spirit of that culture, as in the diffusion of mythology, there is what Jung called archetypes, just suggest that different layers in a spectrum of reality or particularness or individuality of these things. Well, one of the things that you have to wonder if you go for that it's a non-physical, autonomous entity of some sort, then that raises another set of questions, which is, is it a non-physical, autonomous entity unrelated to us except by the fact that we can share the same uh, communication space? Or is it, in fact, somehow related to our own existence, not in the sense of being dependent upon it or maintained by it, but all this talk of soul and spirit leads then to the question of the relationship of the dead to these uh, disincarnate entities. It's very interesting. Did you know that the uh, dogma of purgatory in Christian theology was not created by theologians in Rome. It was created by St. Patrick in uh, an effort to make Christian doctrine more commiserate with Celtic uh, folk belief in the process of converting Ireland to Christianity because the fairy faith 
that was in place when Patrick landed in Ireland was a faith that the dead souls coexist with us invisibly in ordinary space and can be seen by people who have a special ability. And he took that notion and turned it into purgatory and it was so successful in the conversion of Ireland that later councils wrote that into general church dogma. But it was a a genuflection to the Celtic folk belief in this way station of souls that was uh, all around them. And, of course, we've not mentioned that for modern people, the major tool for contacting these entities in any kind of controllable fashion is psychedelic compounds, especially DMT and tryptamines. And those sort of experiences seem to line up pretty well with the the Celtic folklore concerning the habits humor, style, and presentational mode of these uh, entities, or at least a class of these entities, the little people class of these entities. Well, of course, the Celtic people came from Eastern Europe, you know, and they had contact with the, the cradle of civilization, as it's called, or they were the cradle of civilization. And the view of the underworld um, introduced into church canon by St. Patrick, we have already in the Sumerian, Babylonian, Ugaritic models. Um, The uh, Sumerian myth of Inanna and Demusi, for example. You have uh, Inanna goes to the underworld and speaks with her sister Erish Kegel, who is the queen of the underworld. So somehow this is very old, the land of the dead, the journey of the dead, I mean, we're uh, touching really deep stuff here. Chatal Hoyok, there are all these skeletons were stuffed under the house that evidently were left outside in the prairie to decompose, and when nothing but bones were left, they were like folded up in convenient bundles tied and stuffed under the house. So this is uh, an example of one aspect, the, the mythological side, the birth and death, the, the, the deepest layers of the fairy tradition. But in my model of the spirit between the the mundane and the celestial spheres, I I think that there uh, is a a prehistory going back much deeper in which this was more or less light, metaphors of light and so on that were particularized in human form, near human form, and whatever forms were reasonable in a given culture than in whatever language of form is available in the mind of that culture, then these uh, entities would have to materialize in those forms. And I think that the underworld, even though it goes back at least 2,000 years to Sumer, is a displacement from this middle between us and the sky, that some bit of sky, you see, was brought low. And this has to do with the patriarchal takeover and the creation of the unconscious to begin with, that some something was essentially made bad in the perpetual difficulty of our species in dealing with the birth and death experiences. You used the word language, uh, and it occurs to me all of these disincarnate entities would be but dancing hallucinations before us were it not for the fact that they possess the ability to address us in languages which we can cognize and instantly we transfer to them a whole new uh, power and importance because they speak, because they are transferring information from somewhere to us and only a very small percentage of which are we able to do anything with. And I wonder um, exactly what this is about. The traditional notion, and I'm sort of restricting myself now to the no elf end of this, is that they are artificers of some sort. They, they are master artisans working in metals and with jewels and that sort of thing. Well, then is the whole, since shamanism we know begins with a kind of deep interpenetration into early metallurgy, 
that in fact the smith and the shaman are the are two twin brothers that are work linked together in the working with matter the extraction of energy from matter well then is this whispering from the demon artificers a phrase which Jung uses the whisperings of the demon artificers have led us into technological self-expression and perhaps indeed into self-expression period so it's the languages that pose the problem otherwise it would simply be a vision be held before the eyes open to interpretations of all sorts but the fact that they speak to us and we understand is very very puzzling and i don't think uh, you know modern thinkers don't even want to talk about it they just call this schizophrenia and put you in a small room and leave you there but a fair reading as you mentioned last night ralph of the history of modern science as presented by somebody like thomas kuhn shows that the irrational in this objectified form is very active in in the process that we call history it's just that we don't like to admit that because we're committed to an official philosophy of reason and casuistry we have two different models going on here in uh, information transmission as it were there's the horizontal theory of cultural diffusion where for example since you mentioned that these um, entities are artisans in metal then perhaps we learn uh, metalworking from them so the chocolithic revolution or the agricultural revolution we see that it took place in one part of the world later than another part it suggests an outgoing circle wave of transmission the agricultural revolution in britain was in 3500 bc in france in 4500 bc in anatolia in 7000 bc and so on so not only it moves it moves slowly it's been tracked by archaeologists and so on this is the horizontal theory on the other hand if we need for our future evolution and for our past history as well that brought us successfully to this point to have inspiration to make shamanistic journeys to travel vertically and to go into the world of the spirit reaching out joyously toward the celestial sphere where some of this information we need has been stored up somehow or is in a process of evolution then we would expect that the chocolithic i mean the fairy folk would have shown people how to work bronze in many different places at the same time or maybe what has traveled in cultural diffusion is just the habit the wish or the means the technology of communicating with angels so that we can receive this information descartes was somehow open to this dream kiku was open to this dream and we actually have worked hard the three of us in the pursuit of our own dreams in order to draw information down vertically from the celestial spheres in order to re-inspire our own generation with this sacred knowledge so we have these uh, two dimensions in our model whereas modern science and the so-called modern paradigm has allowed only one dimension the, the horizontal diffusion and as far as the original inspiration for bronze metal working that would be an accident that took place near a volcano or i don't know <laughs> something like why that. do you suppose early modern science became so averse to these phenomena at the same time that there was such a zeal for the ca uh, cataloging and description of all the productions of ordinary nature and well, why that's a giant question we know where it happened and when it happened in a short span of time and we can study the history of that time let us say between john d and newton in england and we can study everything that went on we still don't understand what went wrong because none of the developments in the scientific enlightenment seem to be explicitly adverse to angels and uh, newton believed in alchemy and that means particularly astrological alchemy the little astrology and that means that the significance of the stars the hand of god and the 
reality of the Trinity, the full Trinity, that means the body, the soul, the spirit, and and so on. At the same time, Descartes also, Descartes and Newton, that we frequently blame for our me- mechanistic paradigm and, okay. and so on, they were full of the spirit themselves, yet they daren't speak because of the examples of fascist terrorism all around them, and what had happened to other people who spoke. Giordano Bruno, I think, is one of the most particular cases. If you have to point at a particular case, here the fact that he was burned at the stake in a field in Rome in front of an enthusiastic, cheering audience of 300,000 people on Easter Sunday or something, that he was offered his last chance to recant and denied it. And he said, if you'll only say that the world is finite, we'll let you go. And he thought and he said, I shouldn't say that, so I won't. And they burned it. Well, that would be one kind of thing. I mean, it must be a factor in there. And yet, he he didn't recant, as Galileo did. And uh, Well, the whole ambiance of his world was one of stellar demons being called down. And this was how Renaissance magic worked, was by the communication with these stellar demons, they were called, and the lining up of uh, resonant incenses, minerals, colors, to draw these things down. Perhaps they succeeded, and out of the Renaissance came modern science after the pact was made. Starting with an astronomical revolution. Yes. And, <clears throat> I mean, for me, the question seems to be, um, are these classes of entity that, you, that one can experience, and which I think principally are experienced by most people in the realm of dreams? Because in our dreams, we travel in a realm where we ourselves can travel in a strange way. We meet people who are dead. We meet other people from different parts of the world. We meet strange situations and experiences, of quite unpredictable. Our dreams live in a kind of autonomous realm. Now, the reductionist theory is that's just because it's part of our own psyche. The traditional theory is that in our dreams, dreams we travel out of our bodies and we do enter what the theosophists call the astral plane or this other realm. And the realm of our dreams is a, a personal nightly journeying into these realms of other entities, sometimes penetrating some realms, other, other times others. Some people have dreams of angelic beings. And others have dreams of nightmare qualities, of hellish qualities that... All these are different regions, as it were, of heaven, hell, and purgatory, which can actually be accessed through the dreams. Um, th- that's the idea, autonomous dreams. And all people throughout the world believe when you dream, you travel out of your body in another realm. And this, therefore, means that the realm of entities includes the realms of the dead, the realms of the dreamers, and the, the imaginative world of the dreamers. And... Um, then also, does the realm of entities include the spirits of species? For example, the spirit of the Earth, the spirit of the solar system, the spirit of each star, which would be these stellar geniuses or angels, angelic intelligences, the spirits of each species of vegetation, of plant, of mushroom, of, uh, you know, of, of, fl- of each kind of each species of plant or animal has its own way of being, its own repetitive form, its own way of seeing the world and experiencing it, its own way of reflecting participation in the whole from a different point of view from anything else like a kind of monad Mm -hmm. Um, so if each species has its own spirit or guardian spirit or in a Christian terminology perhaps guardian angel but at any rate its own kind of spirit then these are things that shamans have talked to about wolf spirits, crow spirits and all these animal spirits which are a major part of the shamanic fauna and then there are plant spirits of various kinds, and then nature spirits, waterfall spirits, naiads, you know, as you mentioned, all these traditional ariads, mountain spirits, tree spirits, and so forth. This would be the natural historical basis of the entire system, it seems to me, rooted in the species of nature, the intelligences of each species of bird and of animal, and of its characteristic space, its own characteristic spirit. You know, like if you become like a hawk, you fly like a hawk, you see like a hawk. You take on a kind of hawk-like quality of being. But the, the, these sort of hawk spirits and stuff are all biologically grounded, and the others, the angelic ones, are, are rooted in actual stars and planetary systems and galactic spirits. Which, so that 
the whole system is a system of intelligences which in some sense were either have a bodily aspect or were at one time embodied like the dead, the departed. So that is it all grounded in the bodily aspect of the world, as it were, or is there a free-floating, totally separate realm of entities, an entirely autonomous kind, um, that are kind of free-living? Now, it seems to me that Ralph's model of the, the world soul and the world imagination would admit either of these possibilities. You know, whether they're, all entities have a kind of biological or physical base, be it a star, a species of animals or plants, a kind of crystal or whatever. So that everything at one point passes through matter, and that passage through matter allows the eternal existence of the form in this other realm after the matter has dissolved from the form, and then somehow biological existence is fraught with these intimations of immortality. Be who knows why? I mean, we just pick up on our own destiny, as it were, and it lies yes. in this animate but disincarnate realm. Yes. Well, that would be a very happy scenario. I well, think. I would rather speak of animal souls than animal spirits and so on, preserving um, a soul for somehow the ultimate end of the great chain of being. And... Um, Spirit is may be which is some sort of elastic medium, medium connecting it all up. It might be the venue of our travels in dreams and shamanistic journeys and so on, because maybe we cannot reach, not in consciousness anyway, all the way to the soul. But we have visions of the logos that may be very close to the soul. On the soul level, certainly it's all connected up and all is one, as in the oversoul of Emerson and Thoreau and so on. There's a great pancake in the sky, which may participate in the material world by ripping off a piece of it, rips off, and then incarnates in, in, in a blob of protoplasm or something as, as a bad habit, is this incarnation, like our eating meat or something. And, but in this view, which I, I think is the essence of the Hermetic tradition, Everything has soul. Spirit is just spirit. It's like air, but everything has soul. Animals have soul. Rocks have soul. The souls are permanent. Their occupation in a rock or in a tree is, is temporary. The interaction between these different planes is one of a we resonant wave phenomenon that has a different uh, places along the great chain, has more or less of the particulate aspect of ordinary reality where we are beings should be a connected you know geometric object for example is only here and there other places it's all spread out like moving wallpaper so in this view a kind of her her hermetic view we have our greatest opportunity to understand ourselves our history and I think to take a stance for a real future because the history on this scale of the world soul, the morphogenesis, first, uh, this biological life on planet Earth is very recent in the global time scale, whether you believe in the Big Bang and the scientific creation myth or not, that certainly the morphogenesis of the stars, I mean, these entities ha that have taken from time to time in their history incarnation, in constellations in the sky or whatever they long preceded they have a whole lot more experience and the the incarnation in the atmosphere at the motion moment when they decided to have oxygen you know how how was this i mean here, here's a great catastrophe in our evolution which is not quite explained the chicken and the egg problem in this evolutionary great step we got the the oxygen it has something to do with the incarnation of a whim of spirit of of imagination on the level of the world soul decided to screw around with the organisms in the ocean on planet earth and create oxygen and see what happened and all of this has enormous history compared to the extreme youth of our incarnation in animal mammalian bodies and human bodies and the development of language and so on so in traveling up the great chain of being toward the world soul, we're getting in touch with these things which must precede any capability we have of verbalization or understanding and mammalian experience and so on. And yet, they do seem to reach out for contact. 
and then they try, I suppose, to learn our language and communicate as the the corn circles in England, for example, apparently are a kind of a semiotic where a cornfield as an organism of the world soul, or the guy in soul, let us say, to particularize to planet Earth, the guy in soul is trying to speak to us and find some language, so developing an alphabet little by little, just as we developed cuneiform. You see, I think the best theory of them really would be that Azarov says it's the world soul communicating to us, but if it turned out that in fact it were exactly what the most persuaded school of rationalist explainers believes it is, namely whirlwinds uh -huh. of a particularly focused kind, right. you suddenly discover they're right. Suddenly whirlwinds can take on entirely new patterns of focus and write new patterns in the sort that there's a kind of spirit behind the whirlwind the that really expresses itself well, as, the, the as many traditions have always believed. The spiraling form of the whirlwind, a whirlwind is probably an extremely complex organized entity. It's an expression of DNA, it's an expression of the ordering morphology of the galaxy. I would expect it's a higher spiral, yes. It's, yes, it's a higher it's order form form of life, yes. but it still has a spiraling energy form. Mm. Well, maybe uh, some kind of breakthrough is not far away when you, this, these facts I recited about the early modern science and how all these guys were shaped in their ideas by converse with these entities, what would it be like to take that notion seriously enough to actually open a kind of uh, embassy? to the invisible so that we could have <laughs> commerce and treaties and uh, exchange of uh, patents and yes, that well, shamans sort of are ambassadors <laughs> well that must be what in fact is going on but yes. what you need to do is bring a lot to it I mean if you understand the differential calculus and the theory of hyperfine reactions you may be able to work out a different treaty than if all you understand is blowguns and canoe manufacturing.